Hi, folks. Next up on Triangulation, Brett Frischman joins me. He's the co-author of Re-Engineering Humanity. Uh, we'll discuss he and his co-author's perspective that humans may be being trained to give up or avoid critical thinking and what we can do about it next on Triangulation. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Triangulation, episode 422, recorded November 15th, 2019, Reengineering Humanity. This episode of Triangulation is brought to you by Capterra. Find the right tools to make an informed software decision for your business. Visit Capterra's free website at capterra.com slash triangulation. Hi, folks. I'm Denise Howell, and you're joining us for Triangulation. I'm very excited you're here with us today because I'm very excited to speak with our guest, Brett Frischman. He is the Charles Widger Endowed University Professor in Law, Business, and Economics at Villanova University and the co-author of a really fabulous book called Re-Engineering Humanity, uh, which he wrote together with another law professor, Evan Selinger. Brett, great to have you on the show. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. I should so, mention uh, that uh, my co-author, Evan Selinger, is a philosophy professor, philosopher of technology, uh, oh, not a law professor. Can, he might take offense. Even, yeah, he might, he might. Well, I would. I know I would. <laughs> I, I didn't mention t- this to you as we were chatting before the show, show uh, and we've never met before, but you should know I'm a lawyer and uh, do tech law and policy. So that's sort of my framework of looking at things. Uh, but... Uh, philosophy is also an excellent framework uh, with which to approach the issues that you do in your book. Um, uh, why don't you describe for us what caused you and Evan to write this? How did you two sit down together and decide we really need to write about this issue? Well, I mean, the, the origin story for the book is kind of interesting. We um, Initially, we each were writing, sep- doing research and writing uh, and scoping, writing articles and scoping out book projects um, that were separate. Um, and so I'd been thinking a bit about how technology was shaping how we think uh, and how we behave in different contexts um, and had thought about this idea, which we may or may not talk about uh, in this session, but about using a reverse Turing test as a way to sort of evaluate and Id- identify and evaluate when technology is affecting human behavior uh, in a particular way. And Evan had been thinking a bit about writing a book uh, dealing with the outsourcing of thinking of of, of various types of thinking tasks uh, to technology. And um, a friend of ours, a law professor named Ryan Kahlo at University of Washington, uh, he and I were chatting about the reverse Turing test idea and he said, well, you've got to meet this guy, Evan Selinger. He's a philosopher of technology uh, at RIT in Rochester, New York. And he's, he, he's written a lot of popular press pieces and Wired and other places like that. Um, and, uh, you know, you two should really talk. And I said, well, all right. So I emailed Evan, um, found his email address in, online and, and sent him an email and said, hey, I'm going to be in Rochester next week uh, for Thanksgiving break. Like, you know, let's grab a beer. Uh, and so the two of us went out, uh, had a beer, and started talking about our respective, you know, projects we were working on. And by the end of the, you know, a couple hours later, we sort of just decided maybe we should just consolidate, put the books together, and and uh, uh, and, and that there we go. And then we spent a few, a number of years uh, working on it. Um, so it was kind of like doing for each of us. It was in a sense pursuing. What you might think of as mini PhDs in multiple disciplines as we were <laughs> sort of like putting the book together. Um, there's areas that I wasn't as familiar with, areas he wasn't as familiar with. Um, and uh, almost every single chapter of the book required sort of that, that, that mini PhD in a sense. Right. Well, we uh, have to thank Ryan Kahlo for putting the two of you together. He's been on our <laughs> network said, several times. Definitely oh, familiar that's great. with his work. Um, okay. So, uh, for those who haven't read the book, uh, and and we encourage them to do so, uh, let's kind of um, explain, as you do very nicely in the beginning of the book, um, your approach to this 
uh, problem that you coin as techno social engineering, uh, which, as you were alluding to a moment ago, is is the process of technology affecting and changing humans in ways that um, perhaps they're not aware of, perhaps they are aware of, perhaps is beneficial, perhaps is not. Uh, why don't you explain your your term techno social engineering and and perhaps relate it to a term that some of us might be more familiar with, social engineering, which I tend to think of as as manip- nim- uh, sorry manipulation and trickery. Right. Um, so, right. The the idea is the techno social engineering of of humans. So we're we're concerned with essentially how humans how we engineer ourselves. Right. So we've always developed tools for millennia. Um, and in doing so, we have always but sort of been in a process of of engineering ourselves. Um, and you know one of the, it's one of the special things that we as you know Homo sapiens are capable of doing is sort of imagining things that don't exist, creating those things together, uh, including things like technology, but also legal institutions and infrastructures of different kinds, um, which you may think of broadly as tools. Uh, but we re- we build the environment within which we ourselves develop, and that allows us to sort of it gives us a, a means by which to engineer ourselves and what we're capable of of doing and being. Um, and so the concept of techno social engineering is is um, we really use techno social together because most technologies have a social aspect or component to them. Most things we think of in terms of social institutions. Uh, whether law or social norms um, have a technical or tool-like aspect to them. Um, and so we kind of, uh, following STS, science and technology studies scholars, uh, and other disciplines kind of brought techno-social together. Uh, we use the word engineering, and we spent a lot of time debating alternative words we could use besides engineering. We thought about manipulation. We thought about um influence, persuasion, nudging. Uh, there's a variety of different words that have slightly different connotations, but they all describe in one fashion or another how humans using tools shape the behavior, thinking, uh, capabilities of other humans, including, including we do it to ourselves as well when we use tools. Um, and so the, the techno-social engineering is, is sort of meant to be an umbrella term that captures a lot of those different uh, means by which we engineer ourselves. Um, and then again, the emphasis is always on how we are engineering ourselves as human beings. Right. And, and you and Evan are not real thrilled about the direction that we might be headed in that regard, that there's um, evidence that you lay out in your book that... Uh, perhaps by our reliance on technologies and the way in which technologies are affecting us, whether we realize it or not, uh, through things like outsourcing things that we used to do ourselves, uh, that perhaps, as you put it, we're not interested in the engineering of intelligent machines. We're interested in the engineering of unintelligent humans. Uh, So why don't we use that as our jumping off point Um, And why don't you give us some examples of the way in which technology may be dumbing us down? Right. So uh, let me put let me start by saying um, that the concerns about technology uh, dumbing us down are, are, again, those are also millennia old. Right. So the idea we've there's always been. Uh, well, I don't know about always, but there, for, for, for a very long time, there have been complaints about this or that technology dumbing us down, right? Mm-hmm. Or making a, uh, causing us to be worse off, or this technology or that technology is dehumanizing, right? So if we go back to Socrates, we see, we see the same concern about uh, writing uh, tools uh, affecting our ability for sort of oral tradition and memory. Um, the but in the book, we sort of trace this a long, a long way back. But there's always been sort of gains and losses with respect to human capacities and capabilities as we've developed different tools. What's difficult? This actually kind of motivated 
me very early on and when I started thinking about the reverse Turing idea was just there's all there's all of these claims and you see it very often in the the sort of public policy and uh, sort of tech news the sort of the discourse about technology nowadays you're you're either you're either incredibly optimistic or almost utopian in the way you think about technology and what it's going to deliver or you're at the other extreme and you're in, you're, you're a pessimist you're you're a, dystopic about everything and you worry like you know everything is you're we're all going to be turned into uh slaves um and the two extremes rarely grapple with each other or with reality like with the facts um or with how we're actually interacting with technology um and the difficulty be difficulty about claims that this or arguments that this or that technology is dehumanizing or it's making us worse off is that there's no good uh m metric for evaluating um, what's dehumanizing, um, and so one of the one of the goals in the book is to is not to be sort of comprehensive and describe all of the ways in which technology may be beneficial or harmful. It's just to focus on, you know, can we zero in on when technology is affecting important human capabilities, maybe even capabilities that you th you'd think are essential to human flourishing in one form or another. And there's a there's a number of those, and different people might identify or prioritize different capabilities that we have. But as you suggested, in the in the you know the idea that you know we're not really interested in the engineering of intelligent machines. I mean, it's an important thing. I care about it, um, but I'm more interested. I, so one way to say it is, I'm not I'm not so interested in like whether Watson is intelligent or not, whether Watson would pass a Turing test or, you know, is Watson thinking in one so one fashion or another, I'm much more interested in whether how the deployment of Watson in various environments, whether it be a hospital setting or a workplace setting or a home, you know, the deployment of that kind of technology, uh, how it affects the human beings within that environment, that reconfigured environment. So Watson in a hospital setting to help with doctors with diagnoses and doing various things affects how the doctors, the nurses, the patients, the human beings in that environment think and behave and relate to each other um, for, for better and for worse along different dimensions, depending on the, the, the thing you might want to analyze or talk about uh, or evaluate. But in a sense, that's our focus is not so much on whether Watson's smart or not, but it's on how Watson changes the environments that we're in. Um, and, and then the are you, idea. Are you concerned? Of, oh, let me jump into that example and ask sure. if you're concerned. Once Watson, Watson is in a hospital setting and making decisions and judgments and dictating um, suggested courses of care uh, that might otherwise have been done by the doctors and nurses themselves, that they will simply stop flexing those muscles and being able to perform those tasks themselves. Right. So, so one of one of the concerns is whether or not. Um, Right. So whether certain thinking capacities that are ordinarily performed by uh, experts, doctors, based on experience, um, atrophy for lack of practice, for lack mm -hmm. of um, using those skills. Kind of like you think of the um, uh, concerns about – well, so that's just sort of one example. One is that the, the skills themselves atrophy because you don't practice. So you can think about this – you know, the way that London taxi drivers, when they, that there's a study with GPS, when they sort of rely on the GPS, their hippocampus changes and their navigational skills and their mem ability to memorize streets and maps changes, right? So you might be concerned with the atrophying of certain kinds of skills that doctors or nurses might otherwise have developed or might otherwise rely on quite heavily. Um, another sort of related thing is the automation complacency and automation bias uh, where even in those settings where we might want to leverage the the capacity of Watson to to help us with diagnoses, with uh, prescribing courses of treatment or identifying based on patterns and data uh, a good uh, set of uh, steps to take going forward, um, just like a uh, when you've got. Uh, an AI system manage, you know, driving the plane, right, or piloting the plane, you still need the pilot there uh, to identify when things go wrong, right, and what to do to sort of take over. Uh, but uh, the concern with automation complacency and automation sort of biases that creep in when you've got 
you become very used to relying on a system that's automated. Uh, that's another sort of risk, uh, which is apart from whether the skills themselves, whether there's a de-skilling of those in the environment, there's de-skilling concerns. And then there's, even if we've got a human in the loop and we're relying on the human to serve as a check in the case of errors or malfunctions or, um, you know, uh, unforeseen based on the prior data uh, problems, um, the person you're relying on may be checked out. Um, or may have difficulties responding. And so there's ways to deal with these things, but it's partly sort mm -hmm. of recognizing that they exist. Right. Making sure that even if a lot of, a, say, a pilot's tasks are automated, they are still um, flying in environments where, where they're flying themselves and they're doing training to make sure that they are keeping their skills sharp, et cetera. Right. But you, as you say, you need to identify that risk and, and manage it. Um, as you're talking through this, I'm thinking about the world of math and uh, the fact that I have a 16-year-old, or he's about to be 16, um, so I'm watching his education unfold on a daily basis. Uh, you have kids too. You write about that in your book. Um, and uh, so it's interesting for us as people paying attention to these issues to sort of watch you know, how it, it, we have our own real-world experimental uh, subjects in our households <laughs> where we can see how this generation growing up technologically differently than we did uh, functions. And one of the things that I see, um, and I'm sure this was true when I was growing up, I was just never a big math whiz. Uh, but there is a point at which uh, they've, they've taught them the basic calculation functions, division, multiplication, fractions, decimals, all, all the foundational principles of math. And then they go ahead and say, well, okay, you know all that stuff now and we're moving on to more complex things and you can use your calculator. And they do. And uh, in my personal experience, not only does my son use a calculator, but he uses it one step removed by simply asking Siri, uh, what is this plus <laughs> this plus this times this divided by this? And then, you know, so it, he's not even punching numbers in. He doesn't even have the uh, thrilling experience that we all had growing up with our calculators, figuring out whatever equation it was that you put in that then when you turned it upside down said boobless, <laughs> right? He's yep. not experiencing that. Um, so instead he's uh, interacting with a virtual assistant that and relying on the accuracy of the information he's getting there and, and, moving ahead. This is just in a homework environment at school. They're not allowed to use Siri to do math. Um, but on, moving that forward, um, it seems like the world of math doesn't mind if you're de-skilled in doing those basic functions. In fact, they're just kind of annoying and in the way when you're trying to do the more complex calculations. Um, and it occurs to me too that there might be some math that were, and again, I'm just such not a math literate person, <laughs> so forgive me for that. But it does occur to me that there may be some fields of math that wouldn't even be possible without the technology that we have now. And and my son tossed out, what did uh, what did people do before they had calculators? You know, how did they do all this complex math? And I said, well, I, I assume that you used to be able to do everything. Um, computationally written out, you know, down to trigonometry and calculus and everything else that you would, you know, have not needed a calculator because all of those things were developed before we had those tools. But now we have tools like potentially quantum computing. Um, just in what would it three weeks ago, uh, Google uh, announced its um, uh, quantum supremacy I believe is the term, uh, where they uh, demonstrated uh, their quantum computing capability uh, to do a calculation that would have taken our fastest supercomputers 10,000 years, and they were <laughs> able to uh, accomplish it in 200 seconds. And and it occurs to me that in, in that scenario, you're opening up doors that that simply couldn't exist without the technology. So is that... A counterpoint to technology dumbing down, or or is it just 
it may dumb down in some circumstances and in others, it may be a great boon to our ability to advance intellectually. Yeah, I mean, I um, this is very important for the the listeners to 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 know too is that the uh, we by no means claim nor argue that technologies all in points in one direction. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, I yes, I think that there's plenty of examples where. Uh, technology and computational technology and um, yeah, algorithmically uh, supported decision systems are, you know, enable us to do all kinds of things that we couldn't otherwise do uh, in our heads or with a piece of paper and pen. Um, and a lot of those things, the new visas that are opened up, new frontiers in math and science that are enabled by the tools are incredible and incredibly mm-hmm. beneficial. Um, and humans with those tools can often perform and do better than humans without or than the machine itself could do. The, the thing about machines, whether they're intelligent or not, or the tools, whether they're intelligent or not, uh, is they don't know what questions to ask or what, what math problems are worth solving. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where the, the you know, the, the under, having both sufficient understanding of a lot of the basics of math and how math relates to the real world and how math relates to system, uh, physical and other systems allows you to employ the tools powerfully to, 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 you know, to do things in the world that are, that are largely very positive. Um, but you do need to have some understanding of the math and, and maybe the, you know, there's certainly debates about whether, and so, uh, you know, whether computation in and of itself is a, uh, is a uh, basic capacity that's essential to human flourishing. In fact, the funny thing is, in the uh, later in the book, we have where we talk about reverse Turing tests. One of the ter- reverse Turing tests that we suggest is mathematical computation. We think you could easily distinguish humans from machines on the basis of their performance uh, in perf- in, a, in a computation test, basically answering a series of mathematical computation questions. Um, but then we sort of say, well, suppose a human being is indistinguishable from a machine with regard to computation. Does that matter? And we end up saying, well, not really, right? So we don't think that being machine-like in that fashion doesn't really suggest anything about dehumanization or that the person's, you know, worse off uh, or because they're machine-like in that fashion. Um, so I, I think it's the that's you know one aspect of the idea of math and computation. I think the um, the broader point I think you were raising, it's not really necessarily about math. It's about, uh, well, let me actually make two quick points. Um, one is to backtrack a second and say that uh, about humans plus machines often perform. So even if you look at chess, for example, right, you think about the sort of the kinds of computations that a, a very sophisticated AI system can perform to figure out what's the best strategy in a, in a game of chess. Uh, as I understand it, the very best uh, chess players in the world, if you sort of have the open sort of chess where you're allowed to use computers, are human-machine combos. And in those human-machine combos, you know, where you're sort of having humans competing with machines competing against other humans who can use computers or AI systems, um, uh, that, that, that's where you get the highest level uh, of performance in part because of the, the, there, there's a synergy that you can get. Um, that's sort of one point I just wanted to throw in there. Uh, right. The other one that's more general that you were sort of raising with regard to your kids in school mm-hmm. um, and the use of technology in the schools uh, you know, is, is sort of just a broader point. It's not just necessarily about math. It's about all sorts of things where we're relying on um, various kinds of ed tech or various kinds of technologies um, as tools in schools, um, and and uh, to me, that's actually one of the one of the areas that we we talk a bit about this in the book, um, um, and I've been thinking about it a lot outside of the book, like since writing the book, about the educate. I think schools, elementary, all the way on up to universities, is really the battleground for thinking through the role that various supposedly smart technologies play in learning and human development. 
right? Because that's where we, right. we develop as human beings in our school settings. And, and lots of the techno, you know, a lot of the technology that is offered and introduced in schools isn't proven, right? It's, it's introduced on, you know, very optimistic views and some, in some cases, sometimes optimistic promises by vendors. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes it's because school districts have incredibly, uh, sm- like, you know, shrinking budgets and they see an opportunity to sort of get teaching done uh, more efficiently uh, without actually knowing that the technologies being offered deliver uh, what's promised. Um, and I see this, you see this, and we talk about it in, the, in terms of fitness, uh, Fitbits and, you know, the introduction of Fitbits and in, in physical education programs at the elementary school level. Uh, but yeah. you could you could you could extend it to the university context where there's all kinds of uh, learning platforms and and metrics uh, being introduced into the classroom and teaching context where it's not clear at all uh, that those technologies deliver educational benefits or learning benefits for the students, but they sure generate numbers. They ge- they generate things to compute uh, right. and to post numbers and metrics, but they don't necessarily deliver in terms of learning. And I mean yeah. that's. That's a big thing we talk about in the book is this fetishization of anything computational, anything that generates and uses data gets elevated by the promise. And I'm not saying sometimes in many cases that promise isn't real, there isn't real potential there, but often it's not. Um, and often it's not tested. It's not empirically verified that what you're getting, what you're promising is actually what you're getting. Yeah, you have an anecdote in in the book about um Fitbits being rolled out in your child's school system for their PE program and how you were the lone parent who uh, raised the the specter of surveillance, that this was not something yeah. that anyone had even thought of in this context. And that once that was they crazy. began... That thinking- crazy. Yeah. Sorry. I didn't mean to cut once over you. Began- it's crazy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Once they began thinking about it in that context, they began wondering whether it was the wisest thing to do. Um, I have a question for you about all this and about, you know, the technologies that we have to interact with because of our schools or our jobs, et cetera. I noticed that Doc Searles is one of the people who uh, blurbed your book. Um, and I've known him for a long time. I assume you know him too. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I love Doc's approach to the issues that we're grappling today because he always comes at it from the standpoint of the individual. And uh, he hates the word consumer, for example. He vastly prefers the word customer. Um, Always tries to look at it from the standpoint of um, how can we employ technology in in a way that is uh, most beneficial to people. And and with some of the issues that you're raising in your book, uh, I wonder about um, the need for technology that is developed to fight fire with fire. Uh, to to raise that red flag if you were not there to do it, um, to let people know, hey, this thing that um, you're interacting with can uh, is gathering this about you and that about you, and these can be empl- you know employed for various purposes uh, that you might not like. Um, so I I almost feel like we you know as we're considering the role of technology in people's life and how they are techno socially engineered, um, that there has to be a role for um, technology, not just to be um, dictating or or trying to manipulate what they do for whatever purpose, uh, but to be their agent as well and and to try and um, guide them through that minefield. Uh, do you have any optimism that we will <laughs> develop things on similar tracks that um, we can fight fire with fire? Uh, yes uh, and no. Um, mm-hmm. So the first thing I'd say is yes. Doc, Doc's work is fantastic. If you're if, if anyone who's out there listening is not familiar with it, it's worth look, looking up Doc Searles uh, and his wife and Joyce Searles and looking at their work. Um, uh, uh, and it's right that in using technology to enable individuals to have the freedom to be off, to, to exercise their own free will, to stop and think about what they're doing with various tools 
and how they're relating to others uh, while they're using various tools is, is, is incredibly important. And at the end of the book, we talk about the idea of engineering friction into various techno-social systems um, and at different levels, at the very micro, mesro, macro, at you know, different levels of, of the systems we're talking about, whether it's sort of putting friction between you know, your smart home devices so that they only work really within your home and they don't communicate uh, with the cloud uh, without really, you know, warrant whether they really need to um, or it's uh, engineering friction into the interface human computer interfaces that you rely on daily whether it's your human computer interface that is a screen on your on your smartphone or it's the uh, voice assistant uh, which is really just a, a human computer interface um, that's via audio um, and so there's a bunch of like the, the, there are lots of potential opportunities to do that um, there are but the incentives of most uh, technology, I wouldn't rely on the technology companies themselves, uh, I'm sorry to say, uh, to do most of this on their own behalf. And in fact, there's, there's often, it cuts the other way. So, I mean, one example, um, you can do this right now live if you want, or there are folks who are listening in could do it, is if you just, if you have a, uh, an iPhone um, and you pull out your iPhone for a second uh, and, and go into your settings, Go to privacy, uh, turn off uh, the geolocation services for a second, right? Once you've done that, let's just walk through for a second um, what you need to turn geolocation tracking or services is what they call it. Should be said, it should say geolocation tracking. Mm-hmm. Turn geolocation tracking on. What do, what do you need to do? Well, you click a button, right? You hit that button, and then what do you see? What you see is what color it's a little green tab right and green makes you feel like it's good right it's green safe. for go <laughs> green for go you're good to go right <laughs> now now you got your phone are you doing it all right I'm doing so now it. turn it off right all right good awesome see green everybody now turn it off uh-huh. okay what do you need to do what i need to do I... Yeah. what steps did you take i pushed one it, it it's no longer green. <laughs> right. So, but you t- yeah. so to turn it off, you press a button, uh-huh. and then you get uh, a warning text that says, "Hey, you know, if, if you proceed, various things are going to turn off, and it's not going to work with all your various apps." And then you got to do another step, which is so not only you have to read text, which people tend not to want to do, but then you've mm-hmm. got to what's the color of the next thing you need to hit to actually turn it off? Uh, I don't know. They may have changed this in. In iOS, because I didn't get any weird texts or anything. I just turned it you off. It. Oh, so you went from just red, right, green, green to red. No, it's just white now. Oh, they may have listened. So, <laughs> so they maybe they listened to my my <laughs> to my. They may have listened. <laughs> but um, yeah, so and then to the, turn it on, it just goes green again, and it tells me all the services that are using location traffic tracking, and there are way too many. I gotta edit this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this this is change as it goes. This is a great yes. thing. Um, I mean, a week ago, this wasn't the case. Yeah. So this has been this is a recent update. But the if you what what would have happened a week ago? What has uh-huh. and I've got screenshots. I mean, I've written about this, published somewhere. Um, what would have happened was you'd get a warning text and it would be red, and mm-hmm. you'd have to click again. And so there's there's to to turn tracking on. It, it's a smooth frictionless slide to mm-hmm. to be on. To be off, you've got to take a number of steps uphill, and there's a bunch of friction that slows you down and is discouraging, like red text that suggests yeah. it's a warning. So, and, um, and the idea I don't is, know if I'm using the term properly, but uh, I think of that as uh, dark patterns in the yeah, it's not a, it's not world exactly of interfaces. Dark, it's, not exactly it's not exactly a dark, dark, dark It's not a dark pattern. And I, okay. this is what I wrote a little bit about in this paper called Nudging Humans, which is online. Uh-huh. But it's not a dark pattern because dark patterns – Take advantage of a cognitive bias to get you do to do something against your interest. That's in the interest of the person who's nudging you or manipulating you. Um, the the description I just gave about the iPhone geo tracking is justifiable. It's not it's not a necessarily against your interest, right? You can justify it from a transaction cost analysis. Mm-hmm. You can basically say. Lots of users prefer the default of always being on because then they don't have to go into their settings and fiddle with all the little controls. Um, and so it's 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 a different than the typical dark pattern because you can and inf- the designer can justify the practice as mm-hmm. actually being in the interest of some of the customers or users. 
Got so it. it's not exactly a dark pattern, but the point is to say that the you could imagine the design being customer friendly in a Doc Searle sense, right? So a customer friendly version would be asymmetrically designed in the other direction. Mm-hmm. When you want to turn geo tracking on, there would be a little red button that would say, "Are you sure you want to turn it on?" Because if you do, there's 50 different apps on your phone that are going to have access to where you are and when. And then you could, you know, you got to take an extra step. And then when you want to turn it off, it would be green. In other words, you just flip it. So you make, you make it asymmetric in favor of being off of, of having privacy right. and you make it friction, friction full to lose your privacy and be tracked all the time. But of course the the incentives push in the opposite direction because it's a multi-sided platform and there's other parties, there's other customers of Apple besides you. The other customers are the advertisers and the other app, the, the app developers. And that, that same sort of scenario repeats itself over and over and over again in the digital network world. We're often dealing in multi-sided markets where there's not just one set of customers. There's customers who are you and me uh, and individuals, but then there's also the customers on the other side of these multi-sided markets. Um, and so the intermediaries in between, the designers of the human, the, you know, the platforms uh, or the human computer interfaces often have to cater to multiple sides of the same market in their design. And so that's, that's why I'm a little bit uh, we, uh, leery of relying on technical, technological solutions to some of the techno-social engineering problems I've identified. I mean, I think there are some, um, mm-hmm. but I wouldn't necessarily rely on the platform designers to come up with them themselves, and it really takes a lot of pressure to get them to change them. I'm hoping that your, our experience two seconds ago with your phone is indicative of a system-wide update yeah. as opposed to phone just being, for some reason, idiosyncratically different than mine or, or, you know, a bunch of other people. So we'll see. We, we have a highly technologically savvy audience and folks in IRC are telling me, um, that iOS in general always uses green or gray and not red, that that's not a recent thing. Um, but still it's, you know, there's a difference between green and gray. Uh, and that on, if you're an Android user, again, you're not going to get a text. Um, there's just an off switch to turn off, uh, location tracking. So um, I, I definitely uh, see your point about um, certainly from a, a legal standpoint, and you spend a lot of time uh, in your book giving the example of um, how we've all been trained to just click OK on contractual terms and how um, detrimental that is on any number of fronts. <laughs> and this is a, a similar kind of situation just um, because it is kind of a contract, whether you're, you're agreeing to be tracked or not. And certainly I yeah. think uh, under the GDPR in the EU and under California's new privacy law that's going to go into effect uh, in January, um, these things have meaning. And the um, the legal structure, and maybe this is part of the friction uh, that you're hoping that we employ uh, societally against uh, some of these systems, um, is the legal structure seems to be encouraging technologists. Hey, you, it, for years and years, we've had this, uh, everything is opted in until you affirmatively opt out. We'd like to see you go the other way now. And uh, especially when it comes to um, location services and and the gathering of other kinds of personal information about people. Um, right. So there's, we'll there's see. I, I have a lot of panicky clients right now going, hey, uh, what does this all mean for us? <laughs> and right. trying to iron that out with all good intentions. There's a whole bunch of design options that we never see, mm-hmm. right, in between the extremes. So both in terms of the click I agree, you're right, so there's a whole chapter in the book on engineering humans with contracts. It's about the the design of the click-to-contract interface optimized to get a rational, perfectly rational aut- automatic click, which most mm-hmm. of us, most of, most people most of the time uh, just click regardless of the context, right? Whether you are talking about websites or apps or smart TVs in your living room and you're installing them. And then we'll soon see with the IoT, Internet of Things, uh, lots of supposedly smart devices, uh, whether we'll see the click-to-contract interface being the means by which 
uh, you know, you secure that, you create that legal relationship. But there's lots of things in between, uh, both for the click, I agree, for contracts, but also for the even the geolocation services example, but we could, there's plenty of others. Um, there's lots of intermediate design options that could, for example, call to mind the most salient set of uh, terms uh, for which user uh, engagement or deliberation engagement matters most, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and then there's certainly plenty of terms in uh, electronic contracts in different sectors that are more that are largely uniform, uh, for which there really is no uh, reason that consumers, consumers or customers need to deliberate all that much because they're not up in the air, they're not up for grabs, and they're not in any way uh, different from their set of baseline expectations. Right. Um, but there's a whole bunch of things we could be doing differently, but the incentives don't really point in that direction. And even the even the GDPR doesn't necessarily push, or California's new privacy law don't necessarily push towards the creation of those intermediate options that would call, mm -hmm. would sort of raise the salience of what's really meaningful and important. Um, right. Because many of those things just sort of slip slip under the radar. Right. And this is one of those situations where I almost feel like it's a perfect opportunity for a fight fire with fire scenario where there's something that is, um, you know, going along with you in your daily life and, and noticing these things that you're, you're presented with and encouraged to agree to. And, and certainly the average person isn't like you and I going to del delve deep into those terms of service or right. privacy policy. Um, and I understand what they're giving up. This, I have a student yeah. writing a paper on that this semester. Exactly what you just said. That's a great. You're right. So if you had a, we need it. a means by which for each of us to, uh, like even even you and I. I mean, we're both mm -hmm. lawyers. We think about these things. I don't read every single contract I click through. Do you? I mean, Absolutely if not. you did, there's there's empirical studies on this. You would spend, you know. Uh, I, f I forgot the number, 80-something days a year mm -hmm. reading electronic contract terms. I mean, you, you can't possibly, no one has the time. That's yeah. in part why it's perfectly rational to just click I agree every time you confront because it's not just yeah. in the moment in any particular interaction. Um, it's a take it or leave it proposition and the stakes seem rather small, so you might as well just click I agree. It's also in the stream of many, many, many interactions over the course of a week, a, a month, a year, uh, the many different times you interact with the interface, how do you know which of those many interactions are ones that are worth stopping and thinking about? It's that itself, that kind of decision fatigue before you even get fatigued about, you don't even make the decision because you don't know which one to make. And so right. an automatic kind of habitual uh, clicking behavior becomes the default for most of us most of the time unless something about the context, the the person, the, in, the service provider, for example, we're interacting with, uh, unless something causes us to stop and think. And that you're right, it would be great if technical solutions could help us identify those reasons we should be stopping and thinking. Yeah, I, I, I think it would annoy the hell out of people, but <laughs> maybe we could develop a way that it didn't. Uh, we need to take a break and thank our sponsor for this episode of this week, uh, sorry, of Triangulation. Uh, and this episode of Triangulation is brought to you by Captera. Captera is the leading free online resource to help you find the best software solution for your business. What if you could lessen your workload? Hey, we're talking about that here on the show today. You can with Captera. Captera helps you find the right software for your needs fast so you can get back to business even faster. Compare thousands of software options, read reviews, and instantly narrow your favorites. Find the right software right now at captera.com slash triangulation. With over 1 million reviews of products from real software users, you can discover everything you need to make an informed decision. There's validation you can trust and you can be confident with your purchase. Don't forget to leave a review and continue to help Captera be the leading free online resource for software solutions. You can search more than 700 specific categories of software, everything from digital workplace software to video management software. No matter what kind of software your business needs, Captera makes it easy to discover the right solution fast. 
Captera believes that software makes the world a better place because software can help every organization become a more efficient, effective version of itself. So Anthony and I in the uh, Anthony in the studio and I were um, playing around with Captera a little bit right before we started the show, uh, wondering you know how obscure of a business you might have to have uh, before you could stump Captera. Uh, and since I live here uh, in a coastal part of California. We're surrounded by a lot of surf businesses. I wondered um, if Captera could give them a hand. And sure enough, uh, if you put surfing into Captera, you're going to find um, something that's going to help you with surf sign up if you're running an online surf event. Uh, that one doesn't have any reviews, so you might be rolling the dice and might have to help your fellow Captera users. Uh, but at least, you know, if you're in that industry looking for something to lend you a hand, you're going to find a product. Uh, that and you'd find it quickly. I mean, that was just one click. And then we tried the skiing industry, and uh, sure enough, uh, up popped uh, a tool. There you go, Chrono Track Race Registration. That if you're running a ski race, it helps you manage all your athletes and post their scores and stuff. So um, I, I think just with those two examples, you can see how uh, no matter what business you have. Uh, you're likely to find something that might give you a hand here on Captera. So bearing that in mind, you should join the millions of people who use Captera each month to find the right tools for their business. Visit captera.com slash triangulation for free today to find the tools to make an informed decision for your business. That's captera.com slash triangulation. C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A dot com slash triangulation. Captera, software selection simplified. All right, back to it with Brett Frischman, uh, co-author of Reengineering Humanity. Uh, as we bring things uh, to a close here today, Brett, you've alluded several times to the reverse Turing test to see what impact technologies are having on people. Um, explain for us what that is and and why uh, it's useful and how it might be employed. Right. So uh, the the utility of it is both as a uh, an empirical uh, test we could we could use it. Um, social scientists and others uh, could certainly employ different versions of reverse Turing tests, and I'll explain in a second what that means. And, uh, but it's also conceptually useful, I think, for everyone who's not going to go out there running experiments. But it's conceptually useful for a way t- for you to think about um, how you relate to technology, how technology affects uh, you in your capacities. And whether the the ways the capacities that technology affects um, are essential or important uh, to what it means to be human. Um, so the the way we got to the reverse Turing test, one way to think about it is, um, as I said at the very beginning, many people complain that this or that technology is dehumanizing. We don't really have a baseline to figure. You need sort of a baseline to say, well, if it's dehumanizing, you need to know what what being human is in the first place. And that's been debated for millennia, and we still haven't resolved it. Um, and what that kind of triggered in my mind was uh, sort of an analogy to Turing's famous paper where he asked in the, in, in the 1950s when he asked, you know, can machines think, right? So he starts out, his, 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 he starts out asking, can machines think? And he says, look, that, that will lead to intractable debate because intractable definitional debate about what those words even mean. And so instead, he sidesteps that question. He says, well, so Turing says, well, why don't we have an observational test? If, if a machine was mistaken for a human being, that was indistinguishable from a human being um, in, a, in, in its performance in, in a sort of just basic conversational exchange. And so a judge who looks at, you know, there's different agents in different rooms, humans and machines or software programs really, and they're engaging in a textual conversation. If a machine was thought to be by the observer to be a human, well, then maybe that would maybe not necessarily, but maybe that would uh, we could say that that machine was intelligent, right? That would identify a remarkable machine, and then we'd want to evaluate whether the machine was in fact intelligent or not. And so the idea was for us on reverse Turing test was well. Maybe we should be focused on the human side of the Turing line. We should think about whether humans are behaving in a machine-like way. So we can use simple machines as a baseline, right, and say, with respect to some basic capacity, 
Uh, it could be that we start with intelligence capabilities, like we talk about mathematical computation and you know uh, common sense, rationality, and say with different kinds of intelligence tests, you might think is a human acting in a mechanical way in a, in a in like, like a simple machine, right? Are they in so you would be able to distinguish humans from machines or, or artificial intelligence agents, for example, with regard to common sense pretty easily. Right. Uh, so one example you mean? give in the book that I love it, of, of uh, reducing human interactions to a more machine-like interaction is you see something online, it moves you deeply in some way, either in its beauty or the touching relationship that's being portrayed between a parent and child or, uh, you know, what have you, you see something and you're encouraged to interact with it, you might type out a comment or you might just click like or heart. Right. <laughs> and all of those complex emotions are uh, reduced to a token indicator of pleasure or approval and you move on. Right, right. So you've been, we've been trained to click buttons as opposed to mm -hmm. deliberate, deliberate or express ourselves in more meaningful ways in a variety of different contexts. Right, so it's whether it's the click I agree for contracts, or it's clicking a superficial button uh, instead of formulating a deliberate response. Um, we talk a little bit about in the book, and I have a peer review paper that's out for review right now about a study we actually ran a field experiment on Facebook using uh, fake happy birthday notifications. So <laughs> seeing how people and it worked, we got good evidence. Uh, uh, you know the. The response rate on a fake birthday, on the in the wrong birthday, was this in, statistically indistinguishable from the response rate on the on Confederates or the the person whose page it was, on their prior to actual birthdays. People respond at the same rate. Um, only less than a percent uh, of people actually catch on that it's a fake birthday. This is all motivated by the story I do tell in the book, which is true about when not years ago, uh, on a whim, I was annoyed that people. My, e my email inbox flooded with these Facebook notifications saying that people had wished me happy birthday on my actual birthday. And so I said, you know what? I don't want to have to clear my inbox. So I changed, went onto Facebook and changed it to a random day six months later. <laughs> of course, what happens in reality is then six months later, I get the exact same thing happens again. Everybody responds, happy birthday, Brett, happy birthday, Brett. And then I thought about it. And I was like, you know what? It actually doesn't really matter. Everyone's behaving in a rather like, this is kind of like a Turing, a reverse Turing test in a way. Everyone's behaving automatically like a simple machine because they're all weak ties. Like everyone that you're faced, most of the people I'm Facebook friends with. It's like if I told you today or your audience member, or I went to the coffee shop and I said to someone, hey, it's my birthday today. The, the socially engineered response is happy birthday, regardless, because mm -hmm. no one has a reason to know my actual birthday. And so the socially appropriate thing to do is to say happy birthday. They're diff it doesn't matter if you're online, if you're in the coffee shop or whatever the medium is, the response is the same for weak ties. But what caught my attention years ago, and we sort of catch this a little bit in our field experiment as well, is strong ties. My sister-in-law, my brother wished me happy birthday on my fake birthday. <laughs> they were like, happy birthday, Brett, good. with a big exclamation point. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, how did they send this automatic response? Like, why didn't they recognize the fake signal? The, the, why didn't they stop and think? System two of their brain. Why didn't they stop and think about the veracity of the signal? Well, the reason why is because when you're on Facebook, you're more or less trained to not stop or think, right? It, the whole, the platform is largely about very superficial engagement uh, in a very particular kind of way. Um, and of course, I don't want to say everything on Facebook. I'm also on Facebook partly because I teach and I feel like I need to be able to know what different social, how different social networks work, but also because I write fiction and I'm a member of a fiction writing group on Facebook. And in there, in that small context, the, the exchanges actually are more deliberate and thoughtful uh, within a group of people who are sh sharing opinions. So I'm not saying it's, I actually think social media has lots of upsides and lots of benefits, but it also is in, in many contexts and in many different ways, it's designed, it's optimized for, for, for what they call, like an Orwellian doublespeak, they call engagement. It's not real engagement. It's sort of a superficial clicking hearts and likes and, you know, uh, very superficial engagement that's more or less scripted. And so the fake happy birthday experiment we ran is actually like a, an applied version of one of our reverse Turing tests. It's where you ought to stop and think. Strong ties, people who really know your birthday, who really know you, 
ought to stop and think about the veracity of the signal, but they don't. Or at least they don't so, at a rate that one would expect. Uh, final question then. Are you a fan of the controversial Instagram step to hide likes that is rolling out globally as we speak? Sure. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's one of those things that sort of it's 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 a it's a step towards a you know attempting to minimize a particularly harmful aspect of the design, um, yeah. you know, and it and it and it constrains one source of you know like when you're clicking on all this stuff too. The other thing is you're performing digital labor that creates data that's harnessed for other things. So like if you're they're eliminating one particular source of that free labor. You know, maybe that's a good thing too. But it helps, yeah. It, it leads away from training us to behave superficially. So yeah, that the idea of the reverse turning test is is largely to think about when we behave in a machine like way, with respect to a capability that matters, that's essential to human flourishing. And then we can get into a normative or political de or ethical debate about which human capabilities really matter, right? Whether it's our ability to liberate to think for ourselves, to exercise our free will, to have some uh, baseline level of common sense, uh, whether to be able to empathize and relate to each other socially. Um, there's a variety of basic capabilities that I think matter and that at the same time are at risk of being uh, diminished in a world where we outsource them to technology because there's always an app for that. And there's, you know, that's, the, that's kind of the, the short uh, rift on it riff on it. Right. Well, I've, I've certainly enjoyed your book and, and your thoughts Thanks. and your insights into this thorny issue. I do wonder whether there's a future where, where your book and its observations and prescriptions could be written by an algorithm and, you know, <laughs> along the lines of fighting fire with fire. Uh, I'm glad we don't have to answer that question now. <laughs> I'm glad that you and your co-author actually wrote your book and uh, have not lost the capacity to do that. Uh, it is um, just a great pleasure having had the opportunity to chat with you today. Is there anything, uh, final comments or thoughts or uh, anything you'd like to plug or promote before we sign off for our session here today on triangulation? No, I, I mean, I think the main, I mean, the the, mo the most important thing for me to plug is I think is the book and the and the follow on work on it. I mean I, I uh, it's one of those things we hope uh, people read. It's relevant to most uh, you know, it's so many of the ongoing debates. It covers a lot more than just this humans becoming machines kind of angle. It gets into how smart various systems ought to be and how to think about the political and moral issues behind them. Um, and it's got a it's sort of like I said, there's like a, a lot of a lot of work went into sort of doing mini PhDs and like lots of important topics and then distilling it into a relatively accessible uh, public uh, book for the public. So I think it is not just an academic slog. It's really written. This is, you know, one of the reasons it took us many years to do it was and, and many, many reviewers is to sort of boil it down and sort of translate it without losing the, what we think of as the, the rigor necessary um, to communicate it to the broad audience. So I, yeah. I hope your listeners find it find it readable and useful. Me too. Um, I, what I love about it in particular is that it's full of real world examples that just make you stop and think and go, oh my goodness, yes, I hadn't thought about it that way. So um, uh, much That's of that- That's the best endorsement I've heard. Yes, yeah. I love it. <laughs> it's made my day. The Engineering <laughs> Humanity is the book by Brett Fishman, who's been kind enough to join us here today, and Evan Selinger. Thank you so much, Brett. Uh, pleasure speaking with you. Hope to do so again soon. Love to. Thank you very much. All right. Take care. Oh, and I should let everyone listening know that we record this show generally at 11 o'clock on Fridays. We started a little bit early today, 11 o'clock Pacific time. Uh, so if you'd like to join us live, that's when you should do so by going on over to twit.tv. But don't worry if that doesn't fit into your schedule. You can always go to twit.tv slash triangulation and our whole archive of shows is there for your listening pleasure on your device of choice uh, at your time frame of choice. So um, we're just thrilled that you join us however, wherever, whenever you can. And uh, please do so again next week on Triangulation. Until then, please take care. <laughs>